for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, Ian already described a number of material problems. There are a lot of things we don't know. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is how we can use uh, advanced uh, technique, uh, such as a synchrotron X-ray technique, to answer some of the questions. So since today is a celebration of the CP1, so we first look at the past of achievement. Uh, in fact, nuclear technology and high-performance material are two of the greatest achievements in the 20th century. And the combination of these two greatest achievements actually create even better product, which is nuclear power. Uh, it's a reliable and a sustainable and safe energy source. So if we look at the CP1, it is really a pile of a graphite with uranium. But if you, uh, we look at the, today's power plant, it actually have a wide range of materials that employ in a nuclear reactor. Uh, so the success of nuclear energy definitely uh, has to rely on the very good material that can be used in the reactor environment. So although the material have been performed satisfactorily in the nuclear power plant, but we still have a number of material challenges we have to address nowadays. Uh, first of all, the nuclear power plant uh, asking for license renew. So the lifetime is being extended from 40 years to 60 years, or even longer, 80 years. So the material that we'll put in the reactor may not be the same. Actually, we will not be the same. Uh, it will age and will change. So we need to understand how material will age and degradate uh, for long term, and so we can predict how the uh, structure and component can safely run for a long time. Uh, if we talk about the advanced reactor, of course the material challenge is quite different because the advanced reactor will have very different operating environment. For example, um, the sodium fast reactor, now we need to find the cladding material that can tolerate much higher damage dose. Uh, for a light water reactor, maybe 100 dPa is good enough, but for uh, advanced reactor, we probably need material that can stand several hundred dPa uh, damage. And also the high temperature reactor, we don't have a right material that can survive a very high temperature for a very long time. And of course, when we talk about molten salt reactor, do we have a material that can survive in the very corrosive environment? We don't know. And also, in order to have any new material to be employed in the reactor, it must be qualified. And the qualification of new material has been a really long process. So we need to accelerate the process to be able to use the new material in the reactor. After Fukushima, so there's uh, other things we probably haven't addressed uh, enough. Now we need to think about more uh, when we develop new materials. Because the material not only has to perform well in the uh, operating condition, but also has to be able to perform in the accident condition. So with all this number of material challenge, how we are going to address that? Uh, in fact, the material science advance can really help us uh, to do a lot of things which was not done before. For example, the advanced material, uh, now we can design radiation resistant material, we can introduce a nanostructure uh, to increase the radiation resistance. For example, uh, oxide dispersion strength sensor steel is considered for cladding uh, application. We also can design a heat resistant advanced material, for example, Alloy 709, which is advanced stainless steel that has been actively developed under uh, advanced technology um, program um, in NE. Of course, we also need to develop next generation accident tolerant fuel, uh, next tolerant cladding materials such as silicon carbide and maybe the coating on zirconium. There are also a number of other material design concepts, for example, high entropy alloy, multi layers. But what I really want to focus on in this talk is how we can utilize all these new characterization tools. Because now we have very different tools we didn't have before, so we can do the experiment very differently. Uh, those new tools can give us a much better time and spatial resolution so we can see uh, the things we didn't see before. 
And also now we can visualize uh, microstructure in 3D. And also a lot of the experiment now they can do in situ. So we can monitor how material change in uh, different conditions. Of course, the computational tool, uh, particularly when it's combined with in situ experiment, can really help us not only design the material uh, and also to understand the degradation mechanism better and to better predict the service lifetime. Um, in this talk, I will primarily focus on synchrotron X-rays, and um, there are a lot of new experiments that can be done with synchrotron X-ray technique. Uh, for example, um, the experiment can be done in situ, and with the synchrotron X-ray, we can build a very complex sample environment. This is particularly important and useful for studying nuclear material because we want to simulate a reactor environment which has to involve uh, loading and um, temperature and corrosive environment. And also, if we want to see how material processing affects the material, uh, having this in situ capability is also very important. Uh, another uh, very good um, advantage of the synchrotron is 3D characterization. So unlike other 3D characterization tools, uh, X-ray really allow us not just to see the surface, but also uh, see uh, through the interior. Um, for nuclear material, this is, uh, we know the material is not uniform, so it's important we'll be able to map uh, the inhomogeneous microstructure or chemistry or micromechanical uh, state. And also because X-ray is non-destructive, so um, we can really use this technique for um, radioactive material, which is a particular challenge for our community uh, to deal with. And also, Ian talked about how important uh, to bridge different scale of the material so we can understand material better, because material problem is a generic multi-scale, and for radiation damage, when things happen in the picosecond and continue to evolve until uh, many years, so it's very important we not only understand the atomic skill, uh, the individual event, and we also need to be able to link those atomic skill event to mass skill and eventually to macro skill. So we'll be, under, be able to understand how microstructure and property connect together. Uh, this is just to give you an example of how we can do an uh, in situ multi skilled experiment uh, using high energy X-rays. Uh, I really think high-energy high X-ray uh, has a particular advantage when we look at the uh, uh, nuclear material because of a deep penetration. Um, and also because uh, high-energy X-ray uh, allow us to look at a large size sample. So when we, um, uh, when we um, measure the sample, we can measure the bulk property, which is very important. And for uh, study nuclear fuel, because the fuel is a heavy element, so it also needs to have a high energy X-ray. And so this is show you uh, the example. So with a high energy X-ray, nowadays we can do the typical the large scale mechanical test in the beam line. At the same time, to use X-ray to measure the microstructure. And using different detector, we can not only measure one size of the scale, we can measure multi-scale. For example, we can measure, in this case, measure the lattice parameter, lattice strain, and also using small angle scattering uh, technique to, to look at a nano-sized uh, voice or uh, multi-phases. And also going to mesoscale, skill, you can look at individual grain or subgrain and see what happened there. And in one single experiment, you can get um, information from nano-scale to macro scale and also up to macro scale to directly link all these microstructure feature to the materials property, which is unthinkable uh, before. So uh, this is important capability that's enabled uh, by high energy X-ray. Uh, I'll just give you um, a few example on what we can learn from this kind of experiment. So this is an example about 316 standard Stainless steel we know is broadly used in reactors. Almost any reactor uses material. So one of the problems of this um, stainless steel, we know after radiation, material becomes very hard and become uh, very 
yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> become very hard but also become very brittle. So the embrittlement is always something we worry about for the structural material. As you can see, after radiation, the elongation of material is only one or two uh, percent. But in fact, if we test a different stainless steel, this is again 316. I was radiated to the very similar condition, but if you look at this, another 316, the ductility actually can go almost up to 30%. So what happened? The same, it's all this 316, how can one 316 has a such better ductility property than another one? And then we did in situ experiment uh, doing tensile test with um, x-rays and we have um, very good answer for this problem. So uh, during the tensile test, uh, we used an x-ray to scan the specimen gauge. We found the depression pattern along the specimen gauge. Uh, sorry. Yeah, here it is. I don't know if the movie shows. OK, so it's actually um, the diffraction data along the specimen gauge is very different. So we realize actually the deformation is not happening uniformly like in the non-radius material. The deformation actually happened as one end of the specimen and then uh, start to wipe out the gauge. And once the deformation band propagate, it actually triggers the phase transformation. So austenite actually become a martensite. And we know martensite is very hard. That's why the material doesn't have this uh, typical uh, early uh, onset of plastic instability. That's why this material has much longer elongation. So when we talk about advanced material, we often don't think about 316. But in fact, just with a minor uh, tuning of the chemistry or processing, we probably can get some much different performance of the material, of the traditional material. So this is another example. Um, this is basically used a 3D characterization technique, uh, so-called high-energy X-ray microscopy, uh, to look at the deformation uh, microstructure, uh, how the radiation affects the deformation. Because we know in our community, we often use a TEN to uh, study radiation defect. We have a very good understanding of the defect generation. We also have a lot of mechanical testing data, so we understand the property. But it's very difficult to put these two pieces of information together because we really don't have a lot of uh, information as an intermediate scale. So this high energy micro microscopy uh, technique actually now uh, allow us to look at individual grains or subgrains. So what you're seeing here is a neutron radiated ion chrome alloy. So um, before radiation, we can map the green in 3D. And after radiation, when we match it again, the green uh, didn't change. But during deformation, the green actually split into the subgreen. But if we compare the subgreen, uh, the map between the non-radiated sample and Ready sample, we do see the difference. In the ready sample, we see there is some large subgreen coexist with the small subgreens. But actually, in the non-ready sample, you only see small subgreens. So what does that mean? Um, and also, we measure the strain in each individual subgreen. It's actually quite interesting. So this is the residual strain distribution in the non-ready sample. If we read it, the residual string distribution become much broad. And then if we deform, the residual string distribution become even broader in the non-ready sample. But if we have radiation and deformation, interestingly, it looks just like a non-ready sample. So this technique basically tells us uh, when we look at the suffering formation, radiation defect probably play one role. But when we look at the residual strain distribution, radiation and deformation defect probably uh, play a very similar role. This is an example of stress corrosion cracking. Stress corrosion cracking is probably one of the most important problems um, for nuclear industry. But it also happened to be one of the most difficult problems for material scientists to study. 
because there are so many processes happen at the same time, uh, it involves corrosion, involves the stress, so it's very difficult to pin down which process is dominant. Um, it's also difficult study is because this is a cracking problem that happens in a component, but we have to understand the atomic scale mechanism. Uh, so actually high energy X-ray again turned out to be a very useful technique to look at this problem. So this experiment basically used a two 3D technique in combination with the in-situ experiment. So using X-ray tomography uh, during in-situ stress corrosion cracking experiment, uh, you can capture the crack pass. And after the test, you can use uh, uh, diffraction contrast tomography to map the green to show the green boundary. So when you combine these two set of data, you see exactly which green boundary has a crack, which green boundary doesn't. So that tells you which green boundary are more resistant to stress corrosion cracking. So that's really a very important information for doing green boundary engineering to improve the resistance of the material to stress corrosion cracking. So talking about nuclear fuel, it's a very different problem because this is actually the experiment researcher want to look at the nuclear fuel melting um, process. In order to do this experiment, you need to heat the nuclear uh, the fuel to 3,000 degrees C. Now to say you also want to watch how the fuel evolved during this melting process. It's an extremely difficult experiment. But it is made possible, again, this is the experiment done as APS. Uh, researcher build this a complicated uh, sample environment and being able to use a high energy X-ray to do diffraction experiment. And this diffraction experiment will tell us the atomic configuration of the uranium oxygen distribution in both the solids and liquid. So this is finding is very important to understand the nuclear fuel melting process. Talk about advanced manufacturing, we probably cannot ignore additive manufacturing. This has been um, actively pursued in many nuclear, uh, in many industries. So can 3D printing really a game changer for nuclear industry? Well, definitely 3D printing has a lot of advantage in terms of, you know, it's a very quick turnaround and a low cost effect for making parts. And uh, also particularly for nuclear industry, if you have the high value and low volume parts to make, this is a nice technique to have. But maybe we haven't think too much about whether we can even use 3D printing to mix the material, not only meet the requirement of traditional material, but even better property. So when you get the, the product, you have a much better material with uh, right shape of components. So in order to um, understand the additive manufacturing, uh, the process and material better, definitely in situ uh, characterization and uh, x-ray technique can play an important role. And this give you an example. This is an x-ray imaging uh, experiment to show the laser, um, the laser powder bed fusion. There's two movie here. I actually don't know how to play this one. To click the two yeah, moving on the yeah, yeah. the video. If you click both, okay. Thank you. No problem. So uh, these two video actually show two different uh, melting modes. Uh, one is the keyhole mode. One is the conduction mode. So from this movie, you get a very straightforward information how the different melting mode will affect the materials and potentially have the effects on porosity. Um, so you have seen some uh, nice example how synchrotron X-ray can help us to understand the material better. And uh, actually, there's a lot of new techniques that's uh, being developed and to be developed give us a better opportunity. This is just show uh, a one example, the APS upgrade. You know, the beam will become you know, more coherent and the intensity will be higher. So there will be new technique that will be available 
This is a high energy X-ray microscope beamline to be built. So with this new beamline, we'll be able to not only do diffraction and scattering uh, this kind of experiment, there will also a lot more imaging capability will become available to us. And with this new capability, we have better chance to look at the multi skill feature in a single experiment. And also, because this is a very long beam line, this will go outside the APS in a separate building. So we also have the opportunity to build a, a radioactive material laboratories so we can uh, look at radioactive material using those uh, new technique. Well, um, dealing with radioactive material is always a headache. But if we look at uh, the other technology, particularly the robot, this uh, small movie show how robot can really help us to handle radio radioactive material in the future. So not only the uh, advanced characterization technique can also uh, can help us, we also need to think about other techniques that makes you know, our materials study easier. So in the um, previous example, when I talk about in situ experiment, probably you noticed there's a one environmental factor missing, which is the radiation. We know once we put material in the reactor, the damage will happen in a picosecond or even shorter time. So being able to see how radiation damage material generating effect, de defect is very important. So at Argonne, we have this uh, facility called IV antenna. Basically, this is a TEM that's the interface with the ion accelerator. So we can use a heavy ion to uh, generate radiation damage that's similar to neutron damage. Um, so we can watch how defects are um, generated and evolve. So those are little black dot are one or two nanometer dislocation loop. And this movie actually show when the loop become larger, how they can even grow into a different configuration and different size of uh, defect. So it's important to have this kind of a capability. So the question the community probably want to think about it, shall we also have this uh, similar capability, adding accelerator to do in situ radiation experiment with uh, X-ray technique? Uh, Argon actually has a proposal called Extreme Beamline uh, XMAT proposal. So basically, to use uh, both X-ray technique and ion radiation beam to uh, damage the material at the same time to observe it. So to conclude my talk, um, certainly there's a very impressive achievement uh, in the past in terms of nuclear technology and also developing uh, materials that makes the nuclear power uh, possible. And uh, nowadays, there's a lot of new techniques, a characterization technique, uh, computational tools that can help us to understand material um, much better. And we can do a lot of experiments that was unthinkable before. So we um, should take those opportunity and to think about you know, what will be the future um, experiment we can do, how we can use those advanced, uh, advanced tools to accelerate material development uh, to make the nuclear power um, the future uh, energy source. So um, I want to thank a number of people I work with uh, at Argonne and also in other institutions and also several people who contribute to this talk. One person I want to mention in particular, which is John Armour sitting right there. So over the years, we two worked very close together on this project. In fact, with our John's uh, constant and persistent support, I don't think we'll get to where we are. So I want to say thank you to him, and also want to thank the funding source, um, LDRD, and also Office of Nuclear Energy to make this happen. Thank you very much.